Hello. <clears throat> well, I'm here uh, to talk about my second favorite Quentin Tarantino film. Um, and um, this is a film I've actually talked about um, <clears throat> back when it first came out. So, in a way, um, I don't have a I don't know if I have a whole lot to say specifically that I hadn't said before, though maybe I can go on a bit more spoilers this time, just due to the fact that um, when I first talked about this movie, it was brand new, so you know you don't want to really spoil too much about a movie like that, or like this, or any movie, um, until enough people have had time to watch it all the way through. Um, but, um... The movie is, uh, I'm going to talk about is Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Um, I didn't get the 4K one. Um, this is just before I started to start to really get more and more 4K stuff. Just because, you know, it was fairly new and they didn't really offer a whole lot of brand new stuff that, you know, you got on. That they didn't offer any new special features specifically on 4K that you couldn't get on Blu-ray. Um, and with this version, you know, it comes with like this, but also, um, there's the back. And, um, also, because, uh, I got this one from Target, there's this fake, like, uh, uh, little magazine thing, which is pretty cool. All in Something like you'd expect of it from, like, fake magazines and such, so this is pretty cool. Um, um, and, of course, you know, overall, this is about the uh, Rick Dalton, played by uh, um, Leonardo DiCaprio, and Brad Pitt is Cliff Booth, his stunt double. Margot Robbie plays Sharon Tate, and this... Uh, takes place in 1969 which is said as like one of the very last like like where the 60s totally ended was with 1969 which not only because it was the last year of the 60s but what happened that summer with the Manson family murders and all and uh, throughout the film we see glimpses like of early in the beginning of some of the Manson family like the girls and then uh, Cliff Booth goes to Spawn Ranch with one that he uh, noticed early and then ran into each other here and there all the while uh, the first time like he's going somewhere else like the second time they see each other but then they eventually things uh, collide to where He's going one way, and so is she, and then he's going to go visit uh, George Spawn, who, um, you know, he used to uh, shoot Bounty Law there with Cliff Booth, um, that Western show, and um, things are changing, and so, you know, Cliff Booth is really, uh, you know, he's really Rick Dalton's... Um, Gopher, because he's not able to get as much stunt work due to stuff of um, things like people are like you know he killed his wife and uh, you know though Rick says it was an accident some say it was murder and in the book um, which I I have shown I have and I've read um, he does intentionally kill um, uh, his wife he also kills uh, some other people. Um, and he's also, of course, a war veteran, so he's not totally disconnected or, you know, killing isn't a completely separate thing ever since he came back uh, to the States. Um, uh, this film is really a love letter to Hollywood, and uh, throughout the film you can really... Tell, 
um, an era of Hollywood that is, of course, long gone. Um, Margot Robbie as Sharon Tate does a very good job. I know if people have complained, she wasn't in this too much, but I think I do agree with, uh, I do believe I agree with uh, Tarantino where she's like the heart of the film. You know, she's not in it a whole lot, but, you know, we all know what happened to Sharon Tate, and so as thing go, things go on, and we see over primarily with Rick and Cliff throughout the film and what they're doing with, you know, uh, Rick doing the TV stuff as being the bad guy, um, and he also meets with um, uh, Mr. Schwartz, um, played by Al Pacino. Who is an agent, and he's talking to them basically, and you know how he's uh, talking to him about his career and what has gone on since Bounty Law, and how he's basically he he's doing a whole lot of uh, TV work, being the heavy, and he says the thing is with that kind of stuff, you keep playing the heavy, that's gonna leave, that's gonna sort of put something in the audience's mind. They go and see, like, you know, Greg Dalton, who used to be J.K. Hill on Bounty Law. Well, he keeps playing the bad guy. That's going to leave a psychological effect on the audience where now all they're going to see is, you know, J.K. Hill getting beat up by the good guy and, and like, a, a man from Uncle or uh, FBI, a show that he we see him sort of like do some cool trickery and like uh, special effects and stuff with him in certain parts like there's a part with the great escape and we see him instead of Steve McQueen we see him in the outfit that McQueen wears interacting with the actors and people who are actually in the great escape and similar things with putting him very smoothly within these uh, other shows of the time you know, he's going to do this Western where, you know, he's like, he, he's basically going to, he's the bad guy, but he's really evil and stuff. And now he's like, you know, the, the guy says, I hired you as an actor, not to be a TV cowboy. You know, like, he's better than that. He can act. So he's going to wear a wig and he's going to have a mustache. And it's like, so you want me to look like a hippie. And, you know, and throughout the film, he, we know, we get to know that Rick Dalton doesn't like hippies. He doesn't find them to be uh, particularly uh, uh, good at all, and you know, I guess there's always that argument as to why <laughs> hippies aren't good. You know, they might pick up peace and love and such, but you know, and again, so did uh, uh, the Manson family, and we all know how they were. You know, peace, love, hippie stuff, embracing that, but then they were also very dark and violent. And, Charles Manson had people, his family kill them and uh, or kill kill people, uh, certain people, you know, really to send a message to the industry and to people like you know wanted to be like a race war where blacks will be blamed for this and then blacks and whites will fight each other and then once all that's over, Manson and his family will like rise above everything and I guess be the leaders or something which. Thing that just, that alone shows just the kind of mindset he uh, Manson had. Uh, very uh, something was definitely not right. Um, I mean, we can all sort of try and guess what that was. You know, there's various books on the man and documentaries, but even then, it's like I probably only got to just a certain level of understanding the guy. There's still a lot that was kind of. Brad Pitt is excellent in this, as is DiCaprio. And this is the first time the two of them have ever uh, been in a film together. I'm sure I've said that before uh, in my previous video on this, but um, their dynamic is excellent. Um, dialogue is, is really good. Um, I love how they were able to make uh, L.A. and Hollywood look like it did back in the in, in 69. 
you know, got all the radio stations and such as from the day and music and it just works so well and um, this is really excellent this is a film that you know is it truly is his love letter to Hollywood in so many ways like the Hollywood he knew growing up um, that was changing and um, this era that is gone now only really exists um, in the films in the TV shows that existed in music um, of that time period as well as people like him who grew up in it are able to sort of retell all these things but of course as time goes on people get older you know some people do obviously pass away unfortunately but it's really cool for somebody like him to sort of have this sort of era that he loved a lot with movies and stuff just be part of uh, his filmography and it really suits him and um, the characters are excellent um, Roman Polanski isn't in this as much as Sharon Tate but that's fine you know um, Kurt Russell is a you know like a stunt coordinator dude and um, he also narrates different parts of the film um, and he doesn't like Cliff but you know he, Rick that's his stunt double and he does give him a uh, chance at one point we see to have him be his stunt double but then he gets in a fight with Bruce Lee and that's a big scene that's a big controversy saying how you know oh, Bruce Lee and Tarantino has talked about this and how Bruce Lee was sort of full of himself in a bit here and there and there have been people who talked about this and sort of elaborate like the thing was it's like he got frustrated a bit with certain you know people like telling them how to do this or that or something and he was a bit frustrated at first but then he would understand like it's like he came from the, like the world of like martial arts and stuff that he was doing like with TV and film and such, like when he went to do like the Green Hornet, with what they wanted him to do, he did have to adjust to that. You know, it wasn't like he was he felt like he was superior in every way, like in the movie. But you know, there are aspects. Like it, he basically inflates this sort of these aspects of Bruce Lee at point being, I guess, seeming to be a bit full of himself, which. You never know. I mean, I guess it could be a bit understandable if somebody is like sort of rising, like if their star is rising and they also know how to fight very well, as Bruce Lee did, and he was able to do all this. It, it wouldn't be out of the ordinary for somebody like that to be very proficient in something, so then when they're going to do something similar in a different medium, like being sort of told like to hold back or do something a specific way that they might not be used to or they would have done something else you know they'd have to adjust to that so I don't think Bruce Lee was completely as it as was depicted in the film um, of course uh, his daughter was a bit upset at this and very understandably so um, but you know this uh, it is fiction, so. I mean, there are certain aspects that do sort of reflect real life, of course. Um, you know, and Brick doesn't want to go and do uh, spaghetti westerns. He's like, oh, they're all terrible. He was like, oh, I haven't really seen them anybody. How many have you seen? You know, that doesn't sound like a horrible fate, worse than death, as you make it. Oh, they're terrible. Oh, how many have you seen? Oh, I've seen enough. You know, like now, look, I haven't had much of a career, so I can't really under, totally understand what you're going for, through. But you know, and he's like, "What are you talking about? <laughs> you're my stunt double. Like, like I haven't been stunt double for a few years now. I mean, I'm your gopher, and I like, uh, and I like what I'm doing. What I'm doing, I like hanging around your house and doing some stuff while while you're, you know, acting and such. You know, that's no problem for me. Like." Cliff is really sort of, yeah, uh, you know, in a way he's sort of set in his ways and just understands his role in things like that. He's completely content with how things are, and sure, you probably would have loved to have 
continued to be a stuntman all these years. He wasn't, but he understands things. He understands how people think about him and how they look at him. You know, it's not lost on him. He's not... It's not just sort of, you know, out there uh, for him. He's like, uh, uh, like, he, like he's confused. You know, he knows what's going on, and yeah, he's he's very understandable or understanding about all this. And um, you know, this film uh, won some awards. Um, most notably, Brad Pitt won Best Supporting Actor at the Academy Awards. Um, of the nominees, I do think he was the best. Though, of course, I have talked about, you know, The Lighthouse and uh, wishing that Willem Dafoe was nominated and won. Um, you know, what are you going to do? You can't. That's just how things are. You know, you can't change anything. Um, but, you know, DiCaprio was nominated and lost the Oscar. But of the nominees... In that category that year, I, uh, I I think of all those nominees, he uh, yeah, I think Joaquin Phoenix for Joker, he did give a better performance than DiCaprio. Um, I mean, I love uh, the Irishman. You know, I love the Irishman and Pesci and Pacino. They all they those two were great. And Pacino, of course, was in this film. Um, but you know, Pitt was excellent though. I think it is, uh, you can argue that Brad Pitt was the co-lead of the film. Um, I read where uh, it was purposely cut so that um, uh, Cliff and Rick have the exact same amount of screen time in the film. Like, you know, of course, there you have scenes together th uh, throughout the film. But any time, you know, we'd see a scene with Cliff alone. We would then see a scene with Rick alone, same uh, amount of time, and then of course they'd come, maybe back together and scenes working alongside each other and such. So, I think that's really cool um, that um, that was uh, something that you know was you know um, that Tarantino made sure to do. But you know, I guess in terms of awards, you know, if you have two people up for the same category unless one is a true standout um then it's ba they're basically going to cancel each other out that just seems to be the way um it is from what i have noticed you know of course there ha have been uh, people who like best actor best actress supporting actress supporting actress that like you have a couple nominated and one wins uh, the award, and sometimes justifiably so and deserving, and sometimes like, well, somebody else should have won. You know, either the other person in that film should have won, or maybe perhaps both shouldn't have won, but somebody else should have. Uh, like another nominee, or maybe somebody who wasn't nominated, perhaps. But um, it's just unfortunate, I think, that sometimes people sort of get demoted. Um, Either that's by design for like the um, studio or whoever it is in charge of, you know, pushing awards and such, like for nominations and wins. Um, and apparently, sometimes uh, the actor or actress does have a say in what category they get uh, pushed for. Like they can tell the studio, you know, put me in lead or put me in supporting. And then they'll either win or lose. Um, but, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, I do wish uh, that I think like, you know, Quentin Tarantino won screenplay. I really love the dialogue and just everything going on in the film. It's just an, an, an excellent film from beginning to end. It's an excellent film. Um, Zoe Bell also, I want to say, you know, she... Uh, played uh, Kurt Russell's wife. Um, there's like even a part at the very end, of course, with the, the like regulars or something. And Michael Madsen is in the beginning. You know, uh, somebody on Bounty Law. Doesn't have a huge role, but 
know, it's pretty cool to see him. You know, it's, you know, some uh, rough guy. He's like, yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, you know, you just killed. Uh, it's uh, my son, and he's gonna want to talk to you. You know, a bounty law, you know, bounty had to kill somebody is very important, and so they're gonna have some sort of uh, conflict at some point, and that's really interesting. Uh, interaction between uh, uh, Michael Madsen and DiCaprio. And then, um, there's Tim Roth, who I mentioned, I know I mentioned before, but he gets cut. But it says, amongst like the sort of like regulars or whatever, um, you know, Tim Roth does get actual proper credit in the credits. And it just says, right by his side, cut. And then it was said that he was J.C. Brings Butler. And in the book, you get to actually read the chapter that he's in, and you see a, picture, a still image of him with Jay Sebring in the film. It's just a very uh, entertaining uh, moment. I, I would love to see it. It's not in the deleted scenes, unfortunately. Um, James Marsden as um, Burt Reynolds is in the deleted scenes. Um, also, he was given special thanks at the very end of the credits. Same with um, Tim Roth and others. Adam West also was, he, uh, and even though, of course, uh, <laughs> he and Burt Ward really didn't have much to do with this movie, but um, <clears throat> he, uh, you do get to hear um, Batman and Robin on the um, radio at the very end, you know. There's also a post credit scene, which is also where Tarantino makes his cameo. Tarantino's off camera, but he says, and cut. So he's like the director of this um, uh, Red Apple cigarettes commercial that uh, Rick Dalton is doing. And Rick Dalton at the end, he hates Red Apple cigarettes. Like they taste terrible. And then he's angry at this uh, cardboard cutout where he's got like a double chin or something. And um, that's just very uh, hilarious and very amusing. Um, and of course the very end is very graphic where we throughout the film everything is leading up to this one moment and we all know what's going to happen at the end with Sharon Tate and it seems like everything is in line you know we see Cliff deal with some of the Manson family and beats up one of them and makes the guy change the tire because uh, it's not his car it's a uh, Rick's, but Rick's can't drive, or Rick can't drive because too many, uh, uh, over too many drug driving incidences, and so he, uh, has Cliff drive him around everywhere, and, uh, and the very end where we get to see this reversal, of, or not really reversal, but this, uh, chain of events that happens where Rick goes out and yells at these guys and because of their um, car you know there's a big noisy muffler and it's a really terrible <laughs> car it's very noisy and he's angry and yelling at them telling them to get off the road and it calls him Dennis Hopper at one point and then they leave and they have this new plan where they're gonna go and kill him because it's like you know they, they killed they're gonna kill the people who inspired them to kill from TV which is like you know how people like blame certain horrible horrifying crimes on the media like that like, like or stuff like television and movies and music and stuff like that which you know there's not a discussion with that but i do think that's for the most part a lot of nonsense i think people who do these horrible things if they are already really thinking about doing such things like that and um <clears throat> there's something off with them and they have serious problems there's already something with them that, you know, either they're going to do something like that or maybe even something worse. Or, and it's just terrible and they have serious problems and they need to need help and yet they don't get help. And that's always a pr unfortunate thing that happens. <clears throat> um, you know. 
the fact that they um, decided to go and uh, go into Rick's house, and of course at this point he has been, he's now married to an Italian woman, because you know he did go and do spaghetti westerns and do Italian movies and such. So he did go and uh, listen to Marvin Schwartz's uh, Schwartz's uh, advice and took it and uh, did all that stuff and. Things have turned around, and he's pretty good financially now. And it's really interesting to watch how things developed, and how that's basically the end of the of how he and Cliff are gonna be together because he's not gonna be able to afford Cliff anymore because they're gonna go and things are changing, and so unfortunately, Cliff isn't gonna be able to be uh, featured around much, but. What happens and transpires afterwards makes you think that maybe their, uh, you know, it seems like their friendship will possibly remain, but their working relationship won't. But who knows? Maybe this will change things, of course, for uh, Rick, but also Cliff. You know, Cliff uh, then, you know, because they made the decision, the family, to uh, attack uh, uh, Rick's home breaks out in the back, um, in the pool, his wife is a, you know, asleep in bed, and Cliff goes and, because he gets a, at some point, uh, an acid, uh, acid dipped, uh, cigarette, and he goes and decides to, that night figured out, he's gonna smoke it while walking his dog, uh, Randy, and, um, he comes back, you know, he's gonna go and give, uh, Randy some food, but as uh, he's doing so, he, uh, uh, the, the dog, notices something from outside, and he's like, I don't want to get into it, because it's a thing, I, he doesn't want his dog to bark or whine or anything, or food, and uh, like he doesn't want to get into it, because, you know, it's high, but then, you know, they break in point guns at it, a gun at him and have knives and um Rex out back and he uh, you know there's Francesca in the back and a little conversation going on then he realizes who they are because he went to Spawn Ranch we saw earlier and then uh, all of a sudden something happens people didn't expect which is he uh, has a Brandy go and he, he goes and she goes and bites a hold of the guy's arm with the gun and he's too busy with that and punching the dog and hitting the dog and trying to get the dog off him and um, uh, one of them goes to try and attack a, a cliff but he breaks her nose with a uh, dog food. Um, Rick's wife Francesca punches uh, the other lady woman's uh, woman in the face, and then um, uh, uh, Cliff decides he's going to deal with the dude himself. You know, Rex decides to to have uh, his dog uh, get this other girl with a broken nose, and he goes and takes care of the of Rex very easily and stabs him with his own knife and punches him and then like breaks his face breaks his, his neck or, or all the above probably and then he gets uh, attacked by the one woman who got punched in the face by Francesca and um, she uh, like tackles Cliff um, but he is only just stabbed and like the uh, part of his like leg or whatever. He's just so high he's not even like phase. He grabs her, starts smashing her head against like everywhere, like the against the phone and against the like 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 rocky like a fireplace and everything and the. Posters and everything on the 
table and it's just a bloody mess like this film really up until the very end it's not all that uh, violent or bloody but in this last part it is very bloody and yet it's very satisfying to see that all of everything come to fruition especially with the people involved um and then just before he has a chance to uh dispatch of the last one uh he passes out all the while, at the same time while she uh, uh gets the gun and then starts shooting a bit in the air and she walks and walks through the glass uh, uh glass door and Rick sees this happen and then she goes into the pool shoot shooting a bit and then he you know falls in and he goes runs and goes into a shed where he gets a flamethrower that he had used in a movie that's mentioned and we see him practice <laughs> and we also see it a bit when um cliff is over to fix the antenna so he still has his uh <clears throat> flamethrower from that film and then he uses it and uh, torches the remaining manson family member to death and it's just an excellent uh, scene to watch and uh in the end uh cliff goes to the hospital is uh, or cliff goes to the hospital um rick's wife is sleeping randy's still there and um rick's gonna see uh, cliff in the morning as he goes as the ambulance takes him away and then jay sebring is there and sharon stone uh or sharon stone sharon tate oh i said sharon stone but yeah, she invites uh rick up uh like for a drink or two and it's just a very nice way to just wrap everything up you know rick was really feeling down and then he sees his new neighbor early in the beginning of the film you know uh, Rowan Polanski and Sharon Tate and now he gets to meet her and you know this could lead uh, in addition to what has happened at his home this could possibly lead to bigger and better opportunities and in this universe uh, Sharon Tate lives get to have her baby It's one of those things you wish happened in real life, but it didn't, unfortunately. But it's done in such a way where it's very tasteful with the end and how the, the Manson family people who were dealt with, um, how they were just, you know, dealt with. And, uh, and you can only imagine what would have happened um, <clears throat> to the rest of the. Uh, of those at Spawn Ranch, uh, especially since uh, Cliff recognized them, you know. And um, we see Bruce Dern as uh, George Spawn in the film also. Um, Burt Reynolds was supposed to play George Spawn, but he died before he was he filmed any scene. Uh, but Bruce Dern does a very good job. This is just a fantastic film all the way around. Um, I really like it. Uh, I know some um, weren't too fond of this, and I can see why. Perhaps it's a bit long, but I uh, I appreciate the length. I like the length of the film. If anything, I do wish it was a bit longer, just so we could see more of the scenes that are not included, like the Tim Roth scene and uh, scene where. Sharon Tate was in um, Jay Sebring's uh, salon that was in the trailer. Like one of the trailers, you see her there, and it just makes you wish you, you um, just makes you wish you were able to see all the stuff that was cut. Um, I heard how uh, Netflix might uh, do something similar with uh, that they did with The Hateful Eight, make it all longer. I don't know if they'll do it the same uh like uh cut it up into parts like four parts or something but uh if they do ever release like a like a three three and a half hour version 
<clears throat> I'd be interested in it. Um, you also get to see um, in the deleted scenes, uh, Quentin Tarantino actually um, actually have a bigger part in the sense of uh, he was like the narrator of a Red Apple cigarettes commercial. And uh, it's just a really good movie. Um, and that's really all uh, I have to say. Um, so, yeah. Um, only one more movie to go. And, of course, as I, I believe I alluded to at some point, you know, because maybe in, in some other video... Or if, you, if you know uh, my top 10 favorite movies, up 20, uh, you're going to know what my, what probably my favorite Tarantino movie is, because it's in the top five, so that will be next time, um, and yes, uh, I'm, I'm really interested in talking about that one, um, as I have been with all these. So, I hope all of you are having a great day. Hope you're all having a great weekend. Or we'll all have a great weekend. And, um, yeah, have a great week. Uh, see you all next time.